Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is triple bottom line logistics with my friend Tom Raftery. Tom is an entrepreneur, sustainability expert, technology executive, and all-around thought leader. Tom advises logistics and supply chain companies on technology, sustainability, and communications. Tom is also an excellent speaker and a podcaster. Please check the show notes for a link to his podcast. He has two of them. And if you want to learn more about triple bottom line logistics, and you all should, please take a listen to my conversation with Tom. How's it going, Tom? Joe, thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm I'm excited to talk to you about this topic. We were blab, blabbing the other day and talking before we hit record. You have a wealth of knowledge, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. So, Tom, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Sure, yeah. My name is Tom Raftery, as you've already said. I am based out of Seville in the south of Spain. Now, you can tell if you're watching this, you can tell from my complexion. If you're just listening, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from Spain. No, I'm originally... Oh, no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You'd never have guessed. No, I'm originally from Ireland. I'm originally from Cork in Ireland. And I moved here uh, to the south of Spain in 2008. And if you know anything about the weather in Ireland versus the weather in the south of Spain, you'll understand when I tell you I'm a climate refugee. You, you asked me about my company, self-employed, essentially. I have a, a, a business where I help companies with things like messaging, communication, a lot of stuff around consultancy as well in supply chain. I have two podcasts. One is the now, it's called the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast. I say now because I rebranded it as the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast at the start of this year in January. But previous to that, from 2019, right the way through to the start of 2024, it was known as the Digital Supply Chain Podcast. And I published over 380 episodes under that title. Whoa. (laughs) And then at the start of this year, for a number of reasons, I decided to focus in on sustainability and rebranded it as the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast. And I have another podcast called uh, Climate Confident. The Sustainable Supply Chain goes out every Monday, 7 a.m. CET, a new episode drops. The Climate Confident podcast goes out every Wednesday. So I I do that. Uh, I also do a lot of speaking engagements. I do a lot of, as I mentioned, consultancy. I'm also building a product at the moment as well to help companies discover where they are in their supply chain sustainability maturity models. So I'm, I've created a kind of a maturity model that measures supply chain maturity and sustainability maturity. So it creates a five by five grid and then tells people, tells organizations where they are within that grid and how to get to the next step, that kind of thing. So working on that at the moment. Yep. And I, I know you do some training too, right? Yep, I do. And I, I, I do training and I, I teach in a local business school, the business school San Telmo, which is here in Seville. And I've done little bits and pieces for other organizations as well. So it's it's a nice, interesting mix of things that I do. And I've been in the sustainability. I've been working at the nexus of sustainability and technology since 2006, I want to say. And I was recruited into SAP in 2016 as a VP within their supply chain organization. My My title there actually was Global VP Futurist and Innovation Evangelist, which was quite a cool title. It had me doing lots of really interesting things. And then, unfortunately, I was part of the layoffs at the end of 2022, the tech layoffs impacted by those. So hence going out on my own, setting up my own company. I've been looking around for another role as well, just on the off chance, but it's uh, it's not a good time to be job hunting at the moment. So hence going out on my own, staying on my own and doing all these other bits and pieces. I love it. I love it. Not the not the looking for the other job, but I think you have a lot of interesting things to share. And by the way, I should also do the caveat. There's some people look at listening saying triple bottom line logistics. Oh, more sustainability stuff. And I know some people are saying that's not my job, and I get that. But I will say this: please take a listen because 
I'm not going to say it's everybody's job, but it is something that customers are asking for. So I told you this before we hit record, Tom, that I have a friend and sometimes we have this <laughs> debate where he'll say, I don't care about sustainability. And I said, that's fine, except if you're in this business, <laughs> and he is, <laughs> Our customers care about it. So it's almost akin to saying, I don't care about customer service. That's just not something I'm into. <laughs> I think your customers want it. That's just not into it. Customers want it. And if you look at the largest brands in the, the world, they make it pretty clear. And some of it's greenwashing, which is playing a game. Absolutely. <laughs> they love to do their virtue signaling. But I think a lot of companies have in their mission that we have to become leaner and greener. And I think, you please correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, 80% of the greenhouse gases come from the supply chain that we all work in. And the government, it, governments, because you're in Europe, governments are asking us to clean up our act. And I think they're going to push. Better for us to clean up our own act a little bit rather than have draconian solutions driven from the capitals. Please elaborate. No, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Customers are mandating it now for many reasons. It can be consumers or it can be the your customers, your B2B customers. Now, a lot of the B2B customers are demanding it for the very reason you said. The fact that 80% Roughly, it depends on industry, et cetera, et cetera. But 80% is a good number. 80% of a company's emissions come from their supply chain, come from their suppliers, essentially. So hence, you are requiring or you want your suppliers to have the lowest emissions possible. Because if you're an incredibly sustainable company and you get your emissions your own internal emissions down to close to zero or even below zero, whatever. That's only 20% of your total emissions when the other 80 come from your supply chain. So therefore, you've got to work with your suppliers and get them to reduce their emissions. So this is why, to your point, customers are asking you to reduce your emissions. It's so that you are then reducing their 80% of their emissions, which is why it's so important. And it's not just customers. Customers are a big part of it, sure, for that very reason, but also employees are asking for it. So now oh, yeah. you, you've got customers asking for it and you know yourself the cost of customer acquisition really high and you don't want to lose customers for that reason because it's very expensive to, to get and keep customers. So if your emissions are high, you're becoming less competitive. But as I said, employees are also asking for it as well. Nobody wants to be working for a company that has high emissions or who are doing bad things to the environment for want of a, you know, a more generalized term. Younger people particularly want to work for companies with a purpose, companies who are seen to be doing well. And so the cost, again, of employee acquisition and retention is very high. You don't want to be not getting the good candidates. You want to be getting the good candidates and you want to be keeping them. And so again, the same kind of thing. You want to have a good sustainability story to tell so that you're attracting the better candidates when you post a job and you get to keep them because they're happy to work for a company they see as doing the right thing. There's, there's other factors. So if you think of banks and insurance companies, because of the regulations that have come down now on all companies around emissions, banks and insurance companies, they're now being examined on, in the case of banks, on their loan books to make sure that they're not giving loans to companies with high emissions. And so if you're going to a bank for financing and you can tell a low emissions story or a good sustainability story, the chances are your cost of capital would be lower. And similarly, for insurance companies, you want reduced risk, so they want less emissions on their portfolio as well, because again, they're being judged on the emissions in their books and their portfolio. So again, you're a more attractive company to banks and to insurance companies 
if you've got a good sustainability story to tell. And there's, then there's the investment community. Shareholders are demanding it as well. And so boards are now increasingly interested in this. There's lots and lots of stakeholders in this who are all interested in companies having lower emissions, having a better sustainability story to tell. It's not just about emissions. That's probably the most talked about part of sustainability, but and for good reason, uh, because it is one that is an, an existential threat eventually. But also other things like lack of forced labor in your supply chain. There's things like diversity and inclusion. There's lots of other factors. The main one and the most current and measurable one, though, is emissions. Yep, yep. And by the way, we should also, since it's in the title, tell them, what does triple bottom line mean, Tom? (laughs) Yeah, good question. Triple bottom line. So what does triple bottom line mean? Uh, The triple bottom line is people, planet, and profit. So for a company, you have to be good for people, obviously. You have to be doing something that's good for people. You have to be doing something that's good for the planet. But also, you have to be doing something that's profitable. Because if you're just doing something that's good for people and you're not making a profit or you're bad for the planet, that's no good. If you're doing something that's good for people, making something that people want to buy or whatever, and you're also good for the environment, but you're not profitable, same story, you're in trouble. But if you're doing something that is that people want, that's good for the planet, or at least that's not bad for the planet, and also you're profitable, then your business is financially sustainable, which is as important as any other kind of sustainability. Because as I I said earlier, if you're not financially sustainable, then what's the point? You're not going to last. You're gone. And I think when we're talking about logistics, we first, we quickly think about uh, trucking and go, wait, we're in a low margin business. How can we be expected to do better on sustainability? We'll get to that. But I think it's still you know, you're still driving trucks and for the foreseeable future, a lot of them are going to be diesel miles, not all of them. But I think the name of the game is to be the best in class, to be cleaner than your competition and be able to make that point to the supply chains, the brands that you're reaching out to. We'll come to all of that because Tom, I wrote down when we talked the other day, six, at least six points we want to get into about the, how this triple bottom line logistics works. But first, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Some career highlights before you went off on your own. Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Corrigan, Ireland. Grew up there. My dad was a professor of agriculture in the local university. And he used to take me out to the the countryside every weekend. And so he inculcated in me a love of nature. And so when I went to uni, I studied science and then specialized in biology and went on studying for a a PhD in biological control systems. Never quite finished it because I'm a little bit ADD. And so I was always looking for whatever's new and shiny. And of course, when I was in uh, college in the 90s, what was new and shiny was technology and the internet. And so I started getting sidetracked by that and taught myself a load about it and then set up a, a, a software company. And myself and a, and a couple of friends, we started doing initially training on computers, and then we started building computer applications. And again, it was because it was always attracted to what was new and shiny. We started doing these really high end applications using really advanced technologies. We sold, for example, the first mobile phone game to the Irish cellular provider who was Aircell at the time of the late nineties. So it was a game that would work on, on mobile phones and we built a lot more applications. And then, of course, you had the, the, the crash in 2000. And so I kept the company going till 2002 when I merged it with another company, went in as CTO and brought in the development team with me. And what we were doing then was my introduction to sustainable, not to supply chain, because the company we merged with was developing software as a service applications for reverse logistics. Now, they had an application already that was based on Access, Microsoft Access. And what our job as the new development team, what our job was to take that Microsoft Access database and put it into a SQL Server database. So a big 
SQL database that can take a lot more information, put it online and put a, a browser front end on it. So it became software as a service. So there wasn't a lot of software as a service applications available in 2002. Let me tell you, we were very early to market, but we still managed to land some cool customers like Tyco and Philips and people like that. And we were doing a lot of good stuff there. And then I left that company in 2002, go out on my own and set up a, a, a business around social media because I saw this was an up and coming thing. And again, ADD, new and shiny. So I, I started that, I ran that from 2004 to 2008. And in the meantime, I also set up a data center in Cork in Ireland because at the time there were, I think, eight data centers in Ireland and they were all in Dublin and there wasn't one in Cork, a dedicated one in Cork. So myself and two friends, we co-founded a data center there in Cork, which is still in operation today. It's a very successful one. And while we were building it, because I had a social media background, I did a lot of the work getting the word out about it. And we decided when we were designing it that it should be hyper energy efficient because there are three main costs to running a data center. One is connectivity, one is staff, and the next is energy. So on the staff front, we did sweat equity. Easy enough. On the connectivity front, we built the data center on top of a hill which served two functions. One of the big insurance risks with a data center is flooding. But if you're on the top of the hill, that's not an issue. But the other big reason for putting it on top of the hill was we could put a 25 meter mast in the courtyard of the data center and then reach out to the local wireless internet service providers and get them to buy space on the mast, which meant they were buying more connectivity through us, through the building, which brought our per meg per month cost down. So that was another way of helping us on the costing front. And then on the energy, we designed it, as I said, to be hyper energy efficient. And we were like the first people to use the expression cold dial containment online. Because back in 2006, 2008, that time frame, data centers and hardware in general were very closed, very proprietary. No one was sharing anything. And we took the exact opposite uh, strategy. We opened everything up. We told everyone how we were doing everything. We documented it all online with blogs, with video, with uh, Flickr pictures, etc. And that got me a name in the green energy space. And so that started my journey into the kind of the intersection of technology and sustainability that I mentioned earlier. And then in 2008, I moved here to Spain for personal rather than professional reasons. And I didn't speak a lot of Spanish at the time, so I needed a job that would allow me to work from Spain through English. So I got a job as an industry analyst for a company called Red Monk. And I was heading up the branch of Red Monk that dealt with um, energy and uh, sustainability. And so I, I, I led the research in that from 2008 to 2016. And towards the end of 2015, I was approached independently by a couple of different companies. And they said to me, listen, Tom, if you ever think of leaving Red Monk, come and have a chat. And I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me, but that kind of planted a seed. And so in early 2016, I said to the guys, okay, I'll work till the end of February and then I'm out. End of February came, wrote a post on my blog saying, leaving Red Monk, talking to a number of companies, but there's nothing signed yet. So if anyone else wants to get in touch, the window's still open for a while. So I had some fascinating conversations in the next few months. And I joined SAP and didn't regret it for a second. I had a great time working for SAP for a little over six years there as VP. I met some fascinating people, great company. And it was in there that I started the, the podcasts around supply chain and, and climate. And although I was laid off, they did allow me to keep the podcasts. So I, I kept them and kept them running, which was great because I kept my kind of name in, in, in the forefront of people's minds. Yeah, by the way, uh, I've talked to other people, podcasters about this in the past. I always say, if you're going to start a podcast, be careful if it's your passion, but you're doing it for your company. Because if you should leave, and I've it's, and it's worked out for some friends of mine who have been able to leave, take their brand with them. But others, it, it's a painful thing because you might have done a, quite a few of episodes and people know you and they like you. And then when you leave, it's just somebody in marketing now goes, I guess I got to do the podcast now <laughs> or it just goes away. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad you were able to keep it. Me too. Anyway, 
So we're talking about the triple bottom line, Tom, and I had written down when we talked the other day, how do we go about doing this? And again, with the idea that logistics is dominated by, and it, we have to figure out ways not only be greener, of course, but also leaner because this can't be something that says, oh, it only added, it only added 10 cents a mile, but we love it. <laughs> and we'll love it for the next year before we go out of business. But there are companies out there, Flock Freight, I think of it, Flock Freight is a B Corp. Their message is, hey, we're going to save you. They put more in a truck. They say, we don't want half empty trucks driving around. So there are ways to get to a place. And when we use route optimization stuff and we're driving fewer miles, it saves money <laughs> and it also is better for the environment. We all know empty miles is bad, but so are hemp, half empty miles. So there, so don't assume when you're listening that the only way to do this is to sign your death certificate. <laughs> this is this, there are ways to get to that triple bottom line without going broke. Yeah. And in fact, one of the things that I think a lot of people miss out on in the conversations around sustainability is the fact that if you are making an organization more sustainable, you are de facto making it more efficient. And so making it more efficient means it's more cost effective. You're reducing your outgoings and having the same output so as a consequence of that, it, it, it's an immature space right now. So sometimes it can cost a little more to be more sustainable, but long run, the more sustainable organizations will actually have lower operating costs. And then can I have, have either lower pricing or higher margins? It is a win for everyone in that scenario. Yeah. And it's a funny thing. My friend, Doug, <laughs> Before this was before COVID, probably 10 years ago now, I think about it. We were both doing some consulting at this company. And he said, they have all these, it was a scrap company and they had all these trucks. You have to have your own trucks when you move scrap because no one wants to move it for you because you get flat tires in the parking lot. So they had all these trucks and they were a very profitable company. And he said, yeah, but these are all old trucks. They're like, they're all paid for. And he said, yeah, that's great. And he said, but what is the cost the fuel economy is probably much lower than on the newer trucks. And they're like, yeah, but these are our trucks are paid for, Doug. And then he said, let me look at the scheduled maintenance. And he looked at the maintenance records and he said, you guys have to buy some new trucks. And they're like, they're, we're not buying new trucks, Doug, they're paid for. And he goes, and they're costing you money every single month. Now, his that was a purely financial discussion. But he also, after the facts threw in there, also better for the environment at some point that's going to matter. Yeah. And that was probably the last slide on the PowerPoint presentation, but who cares as long as it's happening. And by the way, we all know this. I think the average car on the road is 12 years old, 11 years old. If they were newer, and again, if we get the new, like the all hybrids, you're saving a ton of, I save so much. I have, I got a new car. And I just save a ton of money on gas, which also means I'm better for the environment and I'm not driving a piece of crap car anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never want to go buy new cars. I always say, I just wish somebody assigned it to me. <laughs> I bought the new car for you, Joe. It's in your driveway. Good. I'm on my third EV now, full EV. And, and I understand hybrids can be great. They really can. But when you've got a full EV, if you've got solar panels on the roof, like I have, it doesn't get any cheaper than that. No, that's right. It's awesome. It really is. When it's parked at home here during the day, particularly, I'm in the south of Spain, like I say, so it's nice and sunny. So when it's parked at home here during the day, I just plug it in. Let it soak in the electricity straight from the solar panels. Brilliant. Yep. Very nice. Very nice. And especially works if you're not required to drive long distances. Now, I know we'll have struggle with some of that energy for the long haul trucks, but there's some other stuff out there. But anyway, I had written down six things. I want to go cover some of these. <laughs> so the first thing I'd written down was forecasting. And, and it really gets to this idea of the stuff that never gets to the end consumer. And I'll start and then I want to get your two cents. We grow food all over the world. We grow food 
takes them. We're using fertilizer, we're using water, we're using labor, you know, land, enormous investments. It's not a high profitable, not a very profitable business all the time. Then we harvest it, get it on trucks and move it. And then it goes to the grocery store and then they throw it out <laughs> because it went bad. And you look at, the, it's the ultimate waste because every step of the way we spent money this long process. It's also, obviously, there's people probably within 25 miles of you who are hungry. And not, you, you can't give them rotted food. But, but if we knew a week in advance that it's going bad, we could give it to food banks. We could do so much better with forecasting. And that's just one example. I think, uh, people have qu quoted this on my podcast, 30% of what we make never gets to an end consumer. Forget for a minute everything else, elect, electric vehicles, all the other, if we could just take that from 30% to 20%, it's an enormous amount of energy, human energy and greenhouse gases not ever happening. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in fact, in one of the most recent episodes of my podcast, the Sustainable Supply Chain Podcast, I talked to Pat McCullough, who's CEO of a company called Produce Payer, produce pay as, as he pronounces it. And what they do is they work with farmers and then they work with retailers, the likes of Walmart, et cetera. And he used Walmart as an example. Walmart have for table grapes, they have a specification of about 30 or 40 different characteristics that have to be met by the farmers so that they will accept their produce when it comes into the warehouse. And these are expected. These are inspected, sorry. These are inspected in the warehouse and there's a 5 to 10 to 15% rejection rate for these when they come in. But now when they work with uh, produce pay, what happens is the grapes are scanned while they're still on the vine. And when they hit the exact right criteria, yeah, I mean, they're, when I say scanned, they're scanned and photographed. And when they hit the exact right criteria, then they're picked and packed and sent with certifications and uh, blockchain solution so that when they arrive at Walmart, Walmart can see all the data of what they look like when they were picked, where they were picked, where they came from, what time, how long it's been, what temperature they've been at, the whole kind of thing. So the rejection rate falls from 15 down to zero or 0 0.5 percent. And so there's very little rejection now because they are picked and packed when they meet the specifications provided by the retailer. And so when you do things like that, then you can start to get those rejection rates down and make sure that 30% falls to that 20 to 14 to 15% kind of thing. And there are other things you can do as well. A lot of it is around technology and the use of the likes of sensors, as I said, to monitor the goods as they're in transit and show a trail of data to say, okay, this is what it was like when it was produced or picked or whatever industry you're in. And here's how it's been all the time until it's gotten to you. And now you take it from here. I love that. I love that one. I'll throw another one out there. And we talked about this the other day. And I think this is fascinating. We have certain stores here that have fewer SKUs, like Costco or Aldi, Trader Joe's. They have fewer SKUs than, say, the Walmarts of the world or Meyer here in the Midwest. We love those stores. I'm not thinking, but I think they have 100,000 SKUs. And the others have far fewer, probably a tenth of that. And what you get at Costco, which I'm, I'm such a Costco fan, they curate, here's what we're going to get. And so when they say this is the soap we're selling, it's an, an enormous discount to most of you got to buy a ton of it. But that, but my sense is, and Tom, if you and I were tasked with being in charge of inventory, we would much rather be responsible for 10,000 SKUs than 100,000 SKUs. And I think the waste associated with that would be smaller. And I know some people say, yeah, but we want choices. Of course we want choices, but I like the idea that Costco went and figured it out for me. So when I buy laundry soap at Costco or the Kirkland brand or whatever I buy, they have curated it. They've made that decision for me. I trust them because they're my friends. And, and in a lot of cases, if I'm the one doing the shopping in the grocery store and I have this enormous choice, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at the per unit price. And that's what they'll help me make yeah, they, the decision. They put that right on the yeah. They put that right on the sign at Costco, and they it's mandated here as well. So in every store you go into, whether it's 
the, the classic example, whether it's toilet roll or whether it's toothpaste or whether it's right. dishwasher tablets or whatever it is for the dishwasher tablets, I want to see what's the price for washing the dishes per dishwasher tablet. And they're mandated to show it. So you can have ones with 48 tablets, ones with 60, ones with 20. But if you look at the price per tablet, then boom, what you're paying per wash at that point. And that's, so my choice isn't brand based, it's price per unit based. Yep. Yep. And by the way, a lot of the Kirkland brand stuff is made by big brands that sell the Costco that way. And I believe a lot of the stuff at Trader Joe's, it's not called organic here, but it would, but it's, it would be considered organic here if it just wasn't labeled that way because it is organic. It doesn't meet the standards of Europe organic, but it would meet the U.S. standards for organic. And so these are great products. Usually the maybe the brands you don't recognize in every case, but it works. So I guess just forecasting alone would be an enormous thing. And we're getting better and better at it. But if you're working with a brand that says we really value sustainability and you're the trucking company or the warehousing company, says, let's look at the forecasting. Let's look at, and let us, this brings us to the next point, which is load optimization and, and, and route optimization. I'll, I'll glom them together just for time. We've been using route optimization to mean to make sure we're not driving extra miles that cost us extra money and also bad for the environment. If you could go to a company and say, hey, the reason you want to work with us is because typically when we start working with a company, we reduce the miles 3%, 5%, whatever it is, that's a selling point. It's less money we're going to have to charge you. Better for the environment. You go back to tell your boss that you're doing your job in, on the sustainability front and on the money front. <laughs> Please elaborate. Yeah, no, it, it's very true. And you want, to be, you want to be tracking as well, though, your emissions, because increasingly it's something customers are going to ask for. So if you can say to your customers, okay, Yes, we can reduce your miles by X amount, but what we can also do is we can reduce your grams CO2 per mile driven. Then you start to make them sit up and take notice. Not just are you reducing the amount of miles, but you're also reducing the amount of CO2 per mile. And so that way, because it's what customers are looking for, and if you can provide them with that data, and so this is where the, the idea of data becomes quite important because you've got to uh, roll out a solution that allows you to measure that. But once you can measure that, you then start to see where the inefficiencies are, where things are producing more CO2. And you can start to go, OK, in this area, we need to focus on getting the emissions down there. And that way we're bringing our overall emissions down. And that way we can say to our customers here. Now, this is where we were last year. This is where we are this year. And our aim is to be over here. So you can come on this journey with us, pardon the pun, and we'll get your emissions down while getting our emissions down. Tom, I'm a simpleton. So I always say I want a key performance indicators. and Only the very best metrics grow up to be key performance indicators. So when I was still managing logistics I would say, I want a carrier scorecard, list all my carriers, the 10 carriers we're using for that customer. And then I want to see an on-time performance measure. I want to see some sort of cost measure. And then I, I like billing accuracy because I always feel like if you can't get the billing right, in you're trouble. not doing the job. <laughs> yeah. And then I would have damage-free shipments. Of course, this can be over 99% in most cases for truckload. And I never measured it, but now I would suggest you add one more, which is something that measures something on the sustainability front. And again, you might say, oh, we've got enough problems. Your customers are asking for this. The big brands, if right now you decide I'm going to go sell to a big brand, they have internal goals on this. So you can be a better provider by saying, oh yeah, we measure that. And you can't just add it to the PowerPoint slide at the end and say, yeah, and we value sustainability. That's not going to be enough anymore. You have to add um, a measure. And I would always say when we started the key performance indicators, I'm an automotive guy. And I used to say, we don't say hello without a scorecard in our hand. And sometimes scorecards start off with, it's close. It's not quite right. We know what's wrong with this right now, but we started measuring it anyway. 
And if you say it's 80%, it's directionally correct, start. If you start and say, we're going to get better at this milestone and when we get more information. Anyway, enough of my blather. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a point well made. As, as you and I have both said, customers are asking for it. So yes, absolutely. If you're not doing it and your competitors are, then you're in serious trouble. The sooner you start, because it, it the pressures on this are increasing all the time. And the requirements for this are becoming more and more urgent from customers, from regulators as well. The sooner you start on this journey, absolutely the better, both for yourself and for your customers as well. So yeah, no, start now. And one of the ways to start is to come up, is to find a solution to help you measure your current emissions. And there are free ones out there that you can download and use. So start on that and start working on it and figure out how to, if you're not already doing it, how to measure and report your emissions and then set goals for yourself to reduce them. As I said, you can't reduce them if you don't know where they are. or You can just get lucky, but you won't know if you're not measuring them. The very first thing is to measure baseline. And then once you figure out where your emissions are coming from, then you can start working to reduce them. Yep. And before we hit record, I was mentioning a friend of mine who was at a major trucking company and in charge of sustainability and went and spoke to the top 10 customers. Each one said, yes, we are interested in sustainability. So these would be brands that you would we would all recognize, companies that you, you probably would love to have business from. And I always say, you can't just add it to the PowerPoint slide at this point and say, oh, yeah, see, our mission statement says sustainability. You have to be able to, to point to something. And that's going to be, be point to, here's the processes we already have in place. And again, if you start measuring something, it's, in effect, processes in place. And it could be very rudimentary to start. And I'll throw one other thing. Again, me being a simpleton, I can only use key performance indicators increasingly we're starting to use AI. And so if I was talking to you, Tom, I'd say, we are going to agree to key performance indicators because that's all we can deal with. But if we were, were using AI, AI says, send us, send me all of the metrics you have and I'll give you new insights. And so I think at some point we'll have KPIs for us and the kitchen sink for the AI. AIs are fantastic as well because there are some really good ones out there. And to your point, you can send them a load of data and they can find insights that you might have missed. So it's always worth keeping an eye on that space as well, particularly for things like forecasting and inventory. Really good in that space. Well, what I was thinking about is if I knew, let's just say we did a thousand lanes and I said, I want to know the truck make, model, and year for every one of those trucks. And I want to know how many miles it went. And then have AI just go, boom, here's the miles per gallon for the, each one of those. Here's the emission impact for each one of those. It's coming. Anyway, not only do we have to get the route right, route optimization right, we have to make sure that we're, we all know empty miles are bad and full trucks are good, but half empty trucks are half bad. <laughs> so we have to also get better at filling those trucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, indeed. More about forecasting. Yeah, it is. It, it, and ergonomics. And again, doing things like sharing loads. There are several solutions out there for truckers to go, I'm going from this city to this city. This is the route I'm going. Does anyone need anything moved along that route? So almost the Uberization of trucking. And if somebody says to hey, we really need sustainability. You have a shipper who says that. You could say, you're doing all these LTL. Can we make one truckload? And now that means that you're potentially carrying more inventory at a facility and that's extra cost. But again, do the math. Some products, it's going to make sense. I think we all in the logistics space have to get beyond I'll find you a cheaper truck. And I, the only way I know how to get a cheaper truck is to ask 50 carriers who will be cheapest because that's not giving me the quality that I need. So I want to cover a whole bunch of other things. So we talked the other day about electric vehicles. I know you mentioned you have electric vehicles. We're starting to see the electrification of the final mile, but I would also say we're, we're here anyway using, I think, propane for some buses. 
you know, propane is natural gas. It is a fossil fuel, but it is a, a cleaner fossil fuel than say diesel or regular gas. So uh, talk about this transition that's happening. Yeah, it's a fascinating space to watch. I have been watching the electrification of the passenger vehicle space for a long time. And not just the passenger vehicle space, but also the two and three wheelers. And right now, currently globally, the two and three wheeler space are getting about 40 to 50% of new two and three wheelers sold are fully electric. And and now we're moving into, it, when we move into the past. So there's motorcycles? Yeah. Yeah. Motorcycles and what are called tuk-tuks, the kind of three wheelers that you see in the likes of India and Southeast Asia. But they don't also have those, they don't have loud tailpipes either, right? No, the electric ones have zero tailpipe, obviously. But a lot of the the tuk-tuks pre-electrification were noisy and smelly and very polluting. They were often two-stroke engines, for example. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> I remember that when I was in Thailand, when the light would turn green, yeah, it'd be an explosion. You couldn't see through the cloud of forty motorcycles going. <laughs> they were all two-stroke engines. That's changing. That's changing. As I said, between forty and fifty percent of two and three. Uh, wheeled vehicles globally are the majorities in Southeast Asia, but globally 40 to 50% of two and three wheelers now being sold are electric. Yeah. And then we, when we look at passenger vehicles, it's currently at, in 2023, it was just shy of 20%. So it's on that curve going up. And as you get to the larger vehicles, it's lower on the curve, but it's heading in the same direction. So now we see last mile vehicles and light trucks starting to be electrified. And as you track the battery space, so the battery space, the cost of batteries has cratered in the last 10, 15 years. It's dropped over 95%. And at the same time, the energy density of those batteries has increased enormously. It's more than tripled in the same time. So batteries are being able to store more energy and they're falling year on year in cost. And so it becomes, it just makes more and more sense to electrify more and more vehicles with larger and larger batteries, with greater and greater range, with the ability to carry more and more cargo. And so we're, we're heading the direction that in 10, 15 years time, it, almost every 18 wheeler sold will be fully electric, just because the direction the batteries are going in terms of cost and energy density, it'll make the most sense. And as we're electrifying the grid, it means it'll be the greenest option as well. Because even today, in places like China, where there's a huge amount of coal in their grid, it's still more sustainable to drive an electric vehicle than one that's filled with petrol or diesel. It's lower emissions when you do it on a wheel-to-well basis. So even there it is. So you can imagine in somewhere like the US, where it's, I think, about 60% of the energy in the US grid comes from fossil fuel sources, but that's falling year on year. So every year, your electric vehicles are getting more and more sustainable. And then when you come to, for personal transportation, if you have solar panels, it's even more sustainable yet again, as I alluded to earlier. I know like here in the United States, I just saw something on solar. It can work in Texas very well. It can work in Arizona, maybe California, not necessarily in the Northeast. So we're not going to all have the exact same grid, but we also have potentially wind. I know Texas, I think, has the ability to get wind and, and sun. Yeah. And sun. And they still have the oil. Damn you, Texas. You don't need everything. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, here in the Midwest, Northeast, a beautiful sunny day today, but that's not always the case. No, but I, I was talking to the head of renewables for EDF Renewables in the UK uh, for my climate podcast a couple of months back. And they're rolling out massive solar farms in the UK also not noted for its sunny climate, similar to Ireland. But what I, and I asked him, I put that point to him directly. And he said, yeah, but you don't need direct sunshine. As long as it's a, even if there's cloud cover on the day, you're still harvesting uh, energy from the light. It's only at nighttime that they're not producing any energy. Even in overcast days, they're producing energy. So they're getting about one megawatt per hectare. I think from what I understood, and again, it's we'll get, continue to get better. It's the storage and the movement on the grid. Yeah, we definitely have to improve our grid before we can go all electric. But again, I think one of the things also we've seen all the automakers move toward towards electric, and again, some of that's driven by government mandate. Now, 
we have an excess of those. And it doesn't mean electric vehicles are gone. It means the transition, we really tried to make it fast. It's still transitioning. It's just, you kept saying 10 or 15 years. I think that's probably appropriate. I heard Bob Lutz, and I actually sent you this email the other day. Bob Lutz, who's a famous automotive guy, he's, he says they love the electric vehicles, but this transition was a little fast. We've been working on the internal combustion engine diligently for 125 years. That is not the case with the electric. And you mentioned this, the cost coming down and the efficiency going up. That'll continue to happen. So we shouldn't write this off. It's still coming. It's just not coming overnight. <laughs> All these roads are bumpy. So yeah, yeah. it's not linear. You're right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sawtooth, <laughs> but two steps forward, one step back, but it's, it's going that direction. So there, there will be occasional bumps in the road. Uh, again, more puns on my part, <laughs> but that's the direction we're going. I forgot which company, and I have not talked to him on my podcast, but there is a diesel engine maker that made a, a diesel engine that I think also runs on propane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and which is, again, cleaner, much cleaner. So that that, that may serve as a transition fuel. Yes. But one of, one of the cool things about electric vehicles, which it, it's great that they're low emissions. That's fantastic. It really is. But that's not everyone's priority, particularly fleet managers. It might not be their primary concerned, their customers are concerned about it, sure. But the other big thing that electric vehicles do is the cost of fueling them is significantly lower. Obviously, it depends on where you're based, depends on the cost of electricity versus the cost of diesel, but it is always lower. And then the cost of maintenance for electric vehicles, again, is about 50% the cost of maintenance for an internal combustion engine vehicle. And that's a no-brainer just because if you look at internal combustion engine vehicles today, You've got about 2,000 roughly moving parts in the drivetrain, whereas in an electric vehicle, you've got about 20. So there's far fewer components to, oh, yeah. to maintain or to break down. So they're more reliable, they're easier and cheaper to maintain, and they're far cheaper to fuel. Again, it's a no-brainer, no-brainer. What you have to do, though, is you have to examine your routes. And if you've got a route that carries, again, go back to the old example, toilet roll and the driver for that route is delivering toilet roll for 200 miles a day boom right there an ev will cover that whereas if you have a route that's delivering i don't know beer kegs of beer heavy stuff and that driver is going 200 or even 300 miles a day then you might want to think okay maybe not yet and you've got to optimize your choices based on the routes you're doing. And it could be the case that you look over your current fleet and you look over what vehicles you have, what age they are, what routes they're doing, what they're delivering. And some might be ripe for a, a switch over today. Some might not. Some might need another couple of years for the technology to get better. But you can start taking those baby steps and looking for low-hanging fruit. You mentioned school buses earlier uh, as, as a, a, a target for propane. And I would say, no, I would say, actually, school buses are ideal, absolutely ideal for electrification. A, you're putting kids in them. And propane, while it's a lot cleaner, still spits out noxious fumes. Electric vehicles don't. Uh, you don't want your kids hanging around a vehicle with an internal combustion engine running. Uh, also. They run twice a day, morning and afternoon. In the meantime, they're back at base when you can have them plugged in. Third, their route is very short, typically. They're not doing more than 100 miles a day or maybe 100 miles. They're, they're definitely not doing more than 100 miles in the morning and 100 miles in the afternoon. But even if they were, they're plugged in the meantime. And the other thing is, if you have a fleet of buses and they are plugged in during the day, you can use them to sell energy back to the grid. They can become a virtual power plant. They can arbitrage their energy. They can take in the energy at nighttime when it's cheap and sell it back to the grid during the day when it's expensive, when it's needed. And in that way, they can become a balancer for the grid. The grid will pay for that kind of service. And so it's a win all over again. Yep. I mentioned to you the other day uh, when we spoke that here, I'm in Michigan, we have, I feel like our grid goes down more now than it did when I was a kid. And everybody would say that. And so it's, it's a utility. So it's, it's interesting because it's also publicly traded too. Please explain, are they making profits? And this is all, I, I don't understand how it works. Nobody does. 
all we do understand is 95% of the people in the state of Michigan who are elected to office got money from them. <laughs> so it we're going to have to invest in these grids, however they're managed. So we can, because I know um, my, my sister and her family lost power for a week in the winter and they had to move to a hotel. Oh, they, I, their neighbors moved to the hotel. They moved to my mother's house. And my, and I said to my brother-in-law, who's a Ford guy, I said, what if he's got electric vehicle? I go, so you know, what do you plug into? Because we don't, we drive the other car. So we're going to have to figure some of that out. No, I, I get that. And I, I've heard people give that concern before. If you have an EV and there's a power cut, what do you do? Of course, if there is a power cut, then your local service station isn't going to be able to pump the petrol or diesel into your truck either because those pumps run on electricity. Uh, but if you have solar panels and there's a power cut, you can still charge your car. Yeah. Again, that's a 15, 20 years out kind of thing. But it, again, it's how we're going to get there. It's a path we've begun. And I, I will also say, I said this to you the other day when we talked, I, I saw a very interesting TED talk and I'll look for it. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. And it said the future is eclectic and it was <laughs> making the point, not electric. He's, he said, a, there's going to be really good cases to move stuff to electric. And there's going to be stuff where we're going to move to other get, other fuels. And we should also push ourselves to innovate beyond just what we have. We're doing that with electricity. And I think we're, we know we're pulling away from the greenhouse gases. By the way, I don't even forget the environment for just a moment. I could go for walks every day, a few times a day. I hate walking along the roads when I hear those loud engines and that the fumes are much, much cleaner than they ever have been but they're still emissions and I don't want to smell them. <laughs> so anyway, one other topic I want to talk to you, I've gone, gone longer than I thought we would. I apologize, Tom. I want to talk about e-commerce and returns because I know that you have some ex expertise in it. Yeah, I'll give you my quick back of the napkin and then I want to get your insights. It feels like today we are buying stuff and people are still treating their their home as a dressing room. So I'm going to get three greens, three sweaters, one green, one blue, one red. I'm going to, one's a large, one's a medium. The other one's a, another medium. I try them all on and then I might send two back or I might send all of them back and ask for another. Obviously not the best for the, the brand first and foremost, but also it's not particularly good for the environment and the cars on the road. And I talked to a lot of e-commerce people. They go, is we don't mind. We don't mind. People are bracketing. We don't mind. But I think we're going to see, I think Amazon's already inching into, we're going to charge for some returns. I think we're all going to end, end up with a returns credit score where they say, Probably. Tom Rafferty, I trust. Joe Lynch, I don't trust that dude. <laughs> we He always gives stuff back. So I think we're going to have to get better at the returns. And I'll throw this out there. Pet peeve of mine is sizing. Brands don't help you buy the right size. Yeah, absolutely. Your thoughts, Mr. Tom? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there's I think there's a big issue there with the brands themselves. You mentioned that they don't mind the bracketing. They should, because it's not good, because it does cause increased returns. They need to do a better job of helping people right size. So uh, that when you do go and you do order something in a particular size, you are confident that it's the right size. So I know there is one shoemaker, for example, that I ordered shoes from online. And what they did was they printed out in PDF form a foot that you... I've always said that's the easiest thing to do. It's a piece of paper. Yeah. And you stand on it and you mark with a pencil where your feet are, and then you have your size for your shoe. You order the shoes from them based on the size, based on your pencil sketch on the PDF. They they have the PDF marked with different sizes, of different, and it's the outline of a foot. And that way... Uh, third graders could have come up with that solution, and we don't have it from shoemakers. The one you two talk to does. Yeah, exactly. And there, there are other solutions that some of the brands are coming up with things like using 
the camera on your phone to take a picture of your body and that way try and figure yes. out from that. So yes. There's a lot of things like that are starting to come up, but I think brands need to put more effort into that because you, and I suspect most of the people listening, sure, we might do bracketing, but only because we're not confident. We have no choice. <laughs> because the brands have done a poor job on having consistency in sizes. Yep. There is a shoe store not far from me, and it's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's Fleet Feet. I think they're probably a national chain or at least regional. So I buy my Hoka's over there. And when I go there, they don't save my credit card information or anything else. My address and my name. And when I was in the store, they took a picture. I stood on this little platform and they made a three-dimensional model of my feet. And they're like, yeah, your one foot is 10 a size 10.2 and the other's foot is whatever it was 10.5 and i was like interesting so they saved that and we could do the three-dimensional for a body and uh, might not want to see that i, I know <laughs> but if if they knew what my body was in because it was in the three-dimensional model and i made that available online and said please give me a shirt that fits pants that fit. And we could get to a place where we're talking about custom clothes. And by the way, women, I know all the women in my life say, I hate these kind of blue jeans. These fit, those don't. It's always, I don't think any two women are happy with the same pair of jeans. It's just, or, and that's just. And the, the, the worst thing about clothing, particularly for women, is that the manufacturers decide what age group they want to have their clothes for, and then they shift their sizes to meet the age group that they're targeting. It's really weird. It's anyway, that's a whole nother topic. I've said this many times on my podcast, my staying with my mom for a minute and um, she had some health issues. So I was at my mom's and my mom just always in the background had home shopping network on. And I was like, do you, do you buy stuff? And then she goes, every once in a while. And I go, Really? She goes, yeah. She goes, Joe, they have these women walk out there and they say, my name's Cindy and I'm 52 years old and I weigh this much and I'm this tall and this sweater is a medium and these slacks are this. And then th the next lady walks out. She says, I'm 27 years old. My name's Marge. And she just gives her dimensions and what size she's wearing. And my mom says, when you're watching these, you almost always know what size you are. She goes, I've never returned anything that I bought from them. And I was thinking, that's easy to do for a, sh a company. And we should be doing that and just making some videos. And you could be, they could be people from your office. It could be a branding thing. It makes no sense that we're not doing that. And make it easy because I don't want a bracket. I don't want to return two of those sweaters. I want to buy my sweater online and have it be exactly what I think it's supposed to be. I can also see stores becoming smaller footprint, but also all about getting that three-dimensional model of you. And then they say, Tom, try this sweater on. You just try it on. They go, I'll send this, I'll send this sweater to your house tomorrow. It'll be. And the other thing is we know that people's size changes. So similar to a, a six-month dentist's checkup, the shops could set an appointment with, an appointment with you for a new scan every six months. And that's a way for them to get you back into the shop and maybe upsell some other services or goods to you as well. It becomes a nice touch point for them to have a chat with you every six months. Yep. Yep. And I, I, I can also see the smaller footprint stores not almost have a stylist there as opposed mm -hmm. to, uh, so you say, I'm going to make an appointment. I'm going to go there and they're going to say, Joe, you look good in this color and they, this would be the right cut for you, whatever. It's, it, it's to me, it could be a better experience and leaner and greener. <laughs> so anyway, enough of my blather. I'm going to summarize what we talked about, Tom, and then I want to get your final thoughts. So I'm talking to my friend, Tom Raftery. I kept calling him Raftery. It's Raftery <laughs> with a T. And we talked about, we talked about forecasting. We could get better at forecasting. We can be leaner and greener. And again, I think this is something we can talk to our customers about. Help help us do a better job by forecasting so we can have the routes and the loads optimized. 
And we talked about the route optimization already, load optimization. Full trucks are good. Empty trucks are bad. We all know that. But what about the half empty truck or the two thirds full truck? We need to fill up those trucks. We talked a little bit about all the energy options that are coming for trucks so we can get, and it's not just, it's not just the trucks over the road, all the yard vehicles too. A lot of them should be electric by now. The final mile and the yard vehicles should all be electric for perhaps the forklifts. The electric option, even though it's slowed down in the auto space, it's still coming and it's getting better every day. I know I'm a little, I believe that the propane stuff like that might be a transition thing we use, especially for the over the road trucks, the diesel stuff that's got to go hundreds of miles. It's probably be good for the next 10, 15 years. It's cleaner than diesel for sure. And then we talked about throughout this is the government and the private sector coming together, developing guardrails that make sense, targets that make sense. And then last but not least, we talked about the importance of brands doing a better job on returns so we don't have clothes and purses and everything else thrown out or thrown back into inventory and repackaged and sent to somebody else. Enough of my blather, Tom. Final thoughts on the topic. Sure. It's like we said at the start, Joe, to be honest. This is something that is coming. If if you're not on this sustainability journey for your organization already, you need to get on board fast. Because like I said, if you're not on it and your competitors are, then you're in serious trouble. There's more regulations coming. There's more pressure coming from customers, from your bank, from your insurance company, from your investors, from your boards, et cetera, et cetera. And that pressure is not going away. It's only going to become more intense. Your customers, your employees as well. Do move in that direction if you haven't. Start start small, plan big, start small, start with a pilot, roll out. The, the most important way to start is to start measuring. If you're not already doing that, get some kind of solution in place, which helps you measure so you know where you are right now, you know where you can start to make changes, hit those low-hanging fruits. But also, if you're measuring, it allows you to report primary data back to your customers, which is what they absolutely want even if it's bad even if it's saying you're not in a good shape if you can provide them with primary data it's you're better than your competitors already so that, that's what i would say joe if you're not on the journey get on the journey start looking at ways that you can measure and report against and verify that data that you have by the way tom i'm assuming you're available to advise and consult to these companies that want to get on this journey. I would love to. Yep, absolutely. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to your website and any articles or videos, or we'll put a link in there. And then you have two podcasts. If you send me the links to those, I'll be sure to put them in the show notes so people can take a listen. And you have a YouTube channel. We'll also put that. So any things you give me. A free newsletter as well. Yep. So anything you want to send me that we can put in the show notes so people can follow up with you, that would be great. Tell me what conferences will will we see you at? So the, the next one that I'm going to is in June, so next month. And it is called the Smarter E event, big energy event, the big energy and infrastructure event that's taking place in Munich on the 19th and 20th of June. So if anyone who's listening is going to that, I'd love to see you there. Awesome. Awesome. Tom, thank you so much. You're you're a wealth of knowledge. I love what you're doing and it's an important journey. And again, I I suspect there's a number of people listening saying, oh, you know, like I already got things to do. I I didn't (laughs) want this extra thing put on my plate. It's it's unfortunate, but customers are asking. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Anyway, thank you so much for taking the time, Tom. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.